you're probably already a Stoic in some way. It's part of our culture. Influenced by Socrates and emerging in ancient Greece in the 3rd century BCE, it's a foundation of Christianity. It's maybe the first psychology contributed to the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, guided a Roman emperor, and has become increasingly popular in recent years through events like Stoicon, annual Stoic Week, and a flurry of new popular books and articles. But could it really be a guide to the best possible life? This introduction to Stoicism will mix two things. What the ancient Greeks and Romans actually said, the original doctrines, and how they can be useful for us from our perspective today. Stoicism tries to answer the question of what philosophy is. Epictetus, the Roman Stoic, wrote that philosophy does not promise to secure anything external for humans, otherwise it would be admitting something that lies beyond its proper subject matter. For just as wood is the material of the carpenter, bronze that of the statuary, so each individual's own life is the material of the art of living. What's fundamental for all of us is to work towards and discover how to live life in the best possible way. To stop making faulty judgments or to avoid being the slave of negative emotions and thoughts, to be virtuous and tranquil. Stoicism then is about understanding and changing your entire approach to life. So I'm interested in the Stoics for a number of reasons. Uh, first, the ancient Greeks provide a foundation for all philosophy, everything else being a footnote uh, to Plato. Um, so they're important to study in their own right. Um, I'm also interested in whether it is a philosophy of resignation, um, whether it can be aligned with progressive ideals, which is something I've always been suspicious of. Um, but I'm also interested in it for more personal reasons. I'm interested in thinking about a practical philosophy, um, a philosophy that might be able to change the way we approach the world, um, which is something I know Stoicism has uh, a reputation for, which is why I'm going to include in this uh, a more personal type of video that really documents um, how I feel about Stoicism um, as I read about it. There were a number of notable Stoics, the first being Zeno, who lived from 333 to 261 BCE, and the Stoic school was made popular by Chrysippus after Zeno's death. Unfortunately, most of what the ancient Greek Stoic said has been lost, and what we know of the Stoics we know from the Romans, Epictetus, Seneca, and Marcus Aurelius in particular. I'm going to concentrate, though, less on figures and more on ideas. The default way of thinking for most people is probably something akin to hedonism, that life is best approached by maximising pleasure, whether that's in the short term or the long term. For the ancients, this was Epicureanism, a school that was around at the same time as the Stoics. Another school of thought, the Cynics, argued that because desire leads to a longing and therefore a pain, and things desired can't always be had, then the only way to live a happy life is to not desire anything and to live an ascetic lifestyle. The Stoics argued that both were misguided. According to Seneca, what the Stoics seek is how the mind may always pursue a steady and favourable course, may be well disposed towards itself, and may view its conditions with joy. The Greeks divided Stoicism into three parts, logic, physics and ethics. None of these terms, though, meant quite what they do today. Logic was formal logic, but also rhetoric, language, poetry. Physics mostly meant the study of God and the world, essentially how things worked. And ethics was the study of how to live a good or an excellent life. They also broke all of this into two parts, theory and practice. Philosophy, importantly, needed to be both studied and practiced, learnt and executed. Exercises, reflection and self-improvement were fundamental. For Epictetus, studying logic, physics and ethics were all necessary to live a good life. He wrote that we should study ethics because it's that concerning the impulse to act and not to act, and generally appropriate behaviour, 
so that he may act in an orderly manner and after due consideration and not carelessly. We should study logic because it's concerned with freedom from deception and hasty judgment and acting in error. And we should study physics or the world because it's that concerning desires and aversion so that he may neither fail to get what he desires nor fall into what he would avoid. In other words, we should study the world so we know what to desire in it and what to avoid. For this introduction though, I'm going to focus on the ethical part of the system. And through this, hopefully demonstrate why the other two parts are necessary too. Stoic ethics is the central and most influential component, both for the Romans and for us today. For the Greeks, the words ethics and virtue have slightly different meanings than they do today. Ethics is concerned not with what's explicitly right or wrong, but on cultivating a good spirit to live an excellent life and to practice moral wisdom, and all of the Greek schools of thought agreed that to live a good life was to be virtuous, but again, this had a slightly different meaning. To be virtuous was to live according to nature, our nature, the nature of the world, the nature of others, it's to live as was intended for us. This is one of the reasons we must be interested in logic, physics and ethics, we must study the world to know how to live in it. So if we're to live according to nature, where do we go from there? Diogenes wrote that an animal's first impulse, say the Stoics, is to self-preservation, because nature from the outset endears it. This involves impulses to eat, drink and procreate, but centrally it also involves an impulse to be rational. In fact, being rational, using our faculty for reasoning, is our most important impulse and should be prioritised over all else. Why? Well, Zeno divided the world into three. Things that are good for us, things that are bad for us, and things that we should be indifferent to. But he found that it's hard to find things that are universally and unerringly good for us. Take food. Sometimes it's good, but it's not always good. It's sometimes bad for us or unhealthy or the result of greed. We can eat too much. We eat the wrong things. So for Zeno, it must fall into the category of indifference. The same applies to drink, sex, work, company. In fact, the only thing that can always be universally relied upon and so good is our rationality. Because our rationality can tell us when food is good and when it's bad, when we've had too much or when we should have more. We can use it to live according to our best possible nature, our virtue. It's the only sole guide to this, the only absolute good. It's obviously rational to eat food sometimes. If it's in front of us and we're hungry, then our rational impulse is to eat it. But as a concept, an idea, we have to be indifferent to food. We have to say we could take it or leave it, dependingly. Virtue and rationality are the only things up to us. They're internal to us and everything else is external. And so to crave and need external things is irrational. The only way to tranquility is to be indifferent to them, to accept when they come and not to dwell on them when they don't. In other words, to expect the external world to be good all of the time is to be irrational and to have an emotional reaction over something external to us and not in our control is also irrational. Take this cake. I should, according to Epictetus, be indifferent towards it. I should not crave it, be excited by it or be angry that I can't have it. But this leads to a problem. Can we enjoy it? Yes. Marcus Aurelius wrote that you must consider the activity which is possible for you to carry out in conformity with your own nature as a delight, and that is always possible for you. And Diogenes tells us that they say that there are three good emotions, joy, caution, and wishing. Joy, the counterpart of pleasure, is rational elation. Caution, the counterpart of fear, is rational avoidance. For though the sage will never feel fear, he will still use caution, and they make wishing the counterpart of desire in as much as its rational appetency. So if I can rationally justify having this cake, 
If I've abstained for a long time, or need sugar, or it's someone's birthday and it brings everyone joy, then I can and should enjoy it. This rationality for the Stoics is akin to the soul, the only thing we have control over, the only thing that makes us who we are. For our soul and rationality to align with the world and its demands is the only true and universal good. Quick emotions, especially negative emotions, and uncritical desires are irrational because they're in conflict with the external world, which is ordered in a natural way and out of our control. So to go with our desires against our rationality is invirtuous. Marcus Aurelius wrote that you have the power to strip away many superfluous troubles located wholly in your judgment and to possess a large room for yourself embracing in thought the whole of the cosmos, to consider everlasting time, to think of the rapid change in the parts of each thing, of how short it is from birth until dissolution, and how the void before birth and that after dissolution are equally infinite. In his book A Guide to the Good Life, William Irvine outlines a number of psychological techniques the Stoics used. As we've seen, to be virtuous is to live according to nature, and it's natural that misfortune is everywhere. Everything is perishable. We want things and need things we can't have. Friends and family can be unreliable, can get ill or die. The world is in a state of impermanence. What is, is destined not to be. To expect fortune, then, at all times is irrational. It's not to live in accordance with nature. We also become unappreciative of things, friends and family and belongings that we have in our lives. We can become ungrateful, wish we had more and be difficult to please. The Stoics argue we can come to accept the worst and be more appreciative of what we have through what Irvine calls negative visualisation. To live according to nature which can deal us a bad hand at any moment, we should be prepared, we should imagine the worst happening. We should take a moment to think that the food we're about to eat, the shelter over our head, the person we love, all of these things, even our own lives, could be gone tomorrow. The natural order will lead to things happening to us outside of our control, so in order to live virtuously, we must accept that. Not only this, in order to acknowledge these difficulties, according to Seneca, we should occasionally live as though they've actually happened. We should endure the cold weather and forego food occasionally. We should practice self-control. Imagining and sometimes living the worst will lead us to be more appreciative of what we do have, rather than always wanting more. So I've just got back from a jog and when I left it was perfectly sunny and within 10 minutes uh, it was pouring and hailing and windy and I was planning on going on a nice long, uh, uh, you know, mentally relaxing jog and I just got frustrated and worked up. And I guess where Stoic philosophy would have helped would have been in negatively visualising uh, the bad things that could happen before you undertake the task um, where you know you get annoyed. So I should have taken a moment to think about the things that could have gone wrong and to accept it and enjoyed the fact that I was gonna get, for, get to go for a nice long jog anyway. So I guess the weather uh, is something that's completely irrational and against our nature uh, to worry about. It's not in our control and so it's uh, invirtuous according to the Stoics. Um, to, to worry about it or think about it. Epictetus wrote that it's impossible that happiness and yearning for what is not present should ever be united. Some things are out of our hands and not in our control, and so we must concentrate on the things that are. Epictetus's handbook begins by telling us that some things are up to us and some things are not up to us. Our opinions are up to us, and our impulses, desires, aversions, in short, whatever is our own doing. Our bodies are not up to us, nor are our possessions, our reputations, or our public offices, or, that is, whatever is not our own doing. So we must distinguish between things in our control, internals, and things outside of our control, externals. 
to worry about and hope that we can influence things that are outside of our control is irrational and contrary to nature and virtue. This leads to a problem though. There are things in our control, some choices, and things outside of our control, the weather, but there are also things that we have some control over, like a tennis match, for example. Irvine calls this the trichotomy of control, and even the things that we have some control over can be broken down into parts that we can control and parts that we can't. In the tennis match, for example, we have no control over whether we win or lose, but we do have control over our concentration, our swing, our training, what we eat. Thinking like this is called internalizing your goals. You must put the things that you can't control out of your mind and only focus on the things you can. At work, we can separate the job at hand from the concern about whether our boss thinks it's good work, for example. To worry about weather or accidents is irrational. It involves living in the present and concentrating solely on the things we think are rational in that moment. So I've taught and lectured and presented uh, a little bit um, in the last couple of years, and I guess... Um, it, well, it's one of the things that I do get stage fright um, I'd feel that I improve at slowly but I'd find it difficult you know the classic heart rate rising uh, mouth getting dry um, you can't help but look for the reaction of the audience and you can't help but feel judged but within the trichotomy of control obviously that's one thing that's not in your control at all you can control how people are going to react. You're going to get some people that are not engaged and some people that are. But you are in control of lots of other things, how much you prepare. And in the moment, I guess, I have thought of this before when I'm up there, you can put the people out of your mind in some way. You can talk as if you're talking to yourself. You can talk as if you're the judge of what you're saying. Um, whilst still engaging with the audience. And actually, you know, thinking in that way, thinking about the things I can control in the moment, my own voice, uh, you know, my own thoughts, my own movements, rather than directing my experience outwards, I find is quite a powerful way um, of taking control uh, of the presentation. Finally, to be prepared to live according to nature, we should reflect on Stoicism itself. This is why Marcus Aurelius wrote his meditations. We must cultivate our rational minds. We should think about or write down the things outside of our control that have annoyed us or the things we took for granted. We should decide what we should negatively visualise to appreciate more. We should imagine the unfortunate things that will likely happen to us before we start a task. Think about what we've taken for granted or where we let our desires get the better of us. Okay, so if we're going to take Marcus Aurelius's and Irvine's advice, we might take some time at the end of the day, at the end of the week, to reflect on things we want to improve on or things we want to annoy us. Uh, one of the things for me is the uh, bike ride to work. I'm always getting frustrated with other road users, uh, with cars getting too close. So we divide uh, into two the elements that are in our control and those that are not in our control uh, and we might say okay uh, I can be vigilant that's in my control I can think about the route I can think about the clothes I wear to be warm I can try and be calm uh, but other cars, other road users, other people are not in my control. The weather, especially bad weather, is not, even though being prepared for it is. And we might take some time to negatively, negatively visualise and reflect on all this um, before we start the task that we want to improve. I talk a lot on this channel about the fallacy of the mind-body dualism, the impossibility of detaching yourself from your emotions and your environment. And while this is of course true, 
there is also obviously a way in which we are able to separate ourselves from those things, even if it's temporary, even if it's limited, or even if it's an illusion. The cultural theorist Stuart Hall said that this experience of, as it were, experiencing oneself as both subject and object, of encountering oneself from the outside as another, an other, sort of person next door, is uncanny. It's a weird divide between yourself and yourself, from the person doing the feeling and reacting, and the ego, the person judging, changing. Stoicism is a good way to begin to cultivate this framework and experiencing yourself, your own life, your own attitudes and goals. And I think what attracts me in some way is that it seems flexible. It doesn't mean resigning yourself to a stoic pessimism, but thinking more effectively about what is in your control and what's not. I've always been worried that it's too cynical, that it's about tidying your room before you change the world. But you do have control over changing the world too. You have control over how effectively you speak, how well thought through your ideas are, where you want to direct your efforts. And I think that overall, thinking about the way your own mind functions and having models to improve its disposition, a framework for recalibrating its perspective, is something that in a secular world, or a world that devalues the humanities, is sadly lacking. If you like these videos, I need your help, and here's my request. If you think you get the same value from four of these videos as you do from just one cup of coffee, then please consider pledging just a dollar per video. That's three to four dollars per month to keep this channel going. You can even limit your pledge to one dollar a month, and if you pledge five dollars, I'll add your name to the credits. To those that already support Then and Now, thank you so much. This channel just wouldn't exist without you. You can also hit like, share, follow me on Twitter and Facebook, etc. All of these things really contribute to helping Then and Now grow. Thanks for watching and see you next week.